All right, our cell cycle. What makes your life go round? So let's start out with the three big phases, G1, G2, and the S. All three of these are part of interphase. Your eighth, ninth grade year, they probably talked to you about the little in-between phase, then prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. Sound familiar? A little bit? All right. The interphase is three big parts, G1, S, and G2. So G1, when scientists looked at looked at it under the microscope, they're like, that looks really boring. It's like it's not doing anything. It's just like a big gap in activity. So that is known as gap one. That's what the G stands for in gap. I could go on and on about what a cell does, but the short of it is that cell is doing its thing, right? It's living its best cell life. It's making proteins. It's going and transcribing stuff. It's making lipids, whatever it needs to do. At some point, there's going to be some cell signaling magic that happens that's going to determine what the cell is going to do next. We call that the G1 checkpoint. So in this checkpoint, there's going to be a series of cell signaling that is more or less going to kind of sort of ask questions of the cell's scenario. So in the G1 checkpoint, it's going to ask itself, do we need more cells? If you remember last class, we looked at some sample questions and you had cam proteins that kind of stuck out and was a cell touching another cell. They're looking to see, are we in contact with other cells or is there a whole bunch of space? You know, if we got a lot of room between you and me, we could probably squeeze another one in between here. It's also going to make sure, am I attached? Cells do not replicate, and they should not replicate, when they are free floating. Do you know any cells in your body that flow through veins and arteries? Yeah, your red blood cells especially. Do red blood cells make copies of more red blood cells while they're flowing through your veins? Where are red blood cells made? The bone marrow. Yeah, the bone marrow, those B cells. So um, bone cancer is actually one of the first signs of that is the really uh, prolonged aching and pain, especially like in the femur or the uh, humerus, because those are your big blood producers. But they'll produce the blood in the bone and then send it out into the system. Blood cells themselves only have a lifespan of about 120 days and then they die. Um, and then your liver filters them out and they come out through uh, your fecal material, which is why your poop is brown. It's actually a little uh, dead blood. Um, but they won't replicate on their own because they're not attached. They'll also check to make sure, is there enough nutrients? So um, whatever those cells require for them to be able to grow, for them to do proteins and whatever, they'll make sure that that's there. Now, this is not the cells having a little brain, having a little chat, and having a conversation. These are chemicals. There's receptors on the surfaces. They're receiving information and uh, sending that to the DNA. And through process of chemical reactions, we're going to have the outcomes that we have. So I know I'm kind of anthropomorphizing and making it seem more human-like, but um, it's really just the signaling. Now, if the answer to any of those questions is no, more than likely the cell is going to go into a G naught phase. That little O that you see there is pronounced not, N A U T. If you have a lot of knots, you're, you get kind of naughty. <laughs> if you graph it, you have the X naught and then the Y naught, Y zero. So if a cell goes to the not phase, these do not divide. So red blood cells typically are in the G not phase. 
uh, neurons. They're very specialized and have some stuff, but it's pretty much anything that um, answers no to checkpoint one. I'm going to zoom in on that. Yep. So we don't want cells going off and dividing that aren't attached to things. We don't want cells dividing that are too closely packed in with other cells. We don't want cells dividing when the system is already starving. Because why would we add more to a system that's already on the struggle bus? That doesn't make any sense, does it? So these little guys can go to the G naught phase. Some cells will stay permanently in G naught, like your red blood cells. Um, your liver is a really interesting one. Your liver will be in G naught quite frequently, but your liver can actually switch back into active dividing. In fact, your liver is one of the few organs in your body you can lose up to two-thirds of your liver. As long as one-third remains, it can regrow. So uh, if you get into a horrible wreck and your liver gets damaged, all is not lost. But if you do like brain damage or you do spinal damage, those don't recover quite so well. So protect your head. And then there's our side questions as well if you were struggling to see those. Sorry for the grammar. Are there enough nutrients? Maybe should have been better. But the good news is on AP Bio, grammar doesn't count. Yay! All right. If we're all good to go and we get the green light, so to speak, we'll go to the S phase. What does S stand for? Yes. Synthesis. So what happens in synthesis? Cell replication. Not the whole cell, but the DNA. Yeah. DNA replication. So in plain English, that means we double the DNA. We make copies of everything because if we're going to divide a cell into two cells, we got to make sure each new cell has a full copy of the DNA. And so if you uh, remember back to eighth, ninth grade, you learned about helicase unzips the DNA and then DNA polymerase comes in and adds new bases, and we end up with uh, two whole new strands. How many of you guys remember all those? Raise your hand. Yay, like five, six, seven, eight, and ten. Awesome. If you don't remember it, we'll talk about it in unit six. Yeah, unit six. Not much to say about that one. There isn't an official checkpoint in there. Although your DNA does proofread, and if there's too much damage to the DNA, uh, the enzymes that create it proofread it, um, we can send it to G naught or we go to apoptosis. And we'll talk about that one in a minute. So let's hit G2. What do you think G2 stands for? Gap 2. Gap 2. So our gap 2. This one, the cell is preparing to divide. So it's going to be getting larger. It's got to increase the amount of membranes. Um, Increase the organelles. Because if we've got just like one Golgi, 
and only one cell gets it, but the other doesn't, that's not really going to work out very well. So we've kind of got to double everything up to make sure that we're set for cell division. We can like, you get this half, you get this half. Larger. And I'll zoom in on it when I finish the corner here. So with our checkpoint, checkpoint number two, it's very similar to checkpoint one. So I can't spell today. Same questions, but also the DNA replicate properly. Or were there some like big fundamental errors? Am I big? enough. If it's a little small scrawny cell, it's really not in its best interest to divide. So if the answer to these questions are no, um, if it's a DNA replication thing, that's pretty bad. We're going to have to probably end that cell. If it's a size issue, then we just give it a little bit more time. So kind of depends upon the series seriousness of the questions. So then with those questions, if the answer to those are no, then the cell can go to G0 or apoptosis, which basically is cell death. So it'll get a little signal that'll say um, this cell is not fit for further replication or survival. I, if needed, what'll happen is that the cell will kind of undergo a self-destruct sequence and it'll start chopping up the interior organelles and it'll chop up the interior DNA and it forms these weird little things called blebs. And then it will send a signal out for a macrophage to eat me. <laughs> and so a big white blood cell will come through and it'll nom, 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 eat up that cell, recycle all the parts, and life goes on. In fact, apoptosis is a really good thing because if we have a cell that's kind of messed up, do we want to allow that cell to continue to exist in our system? No, because it's probably only going to cause problems. So, um, you know... Don't think of it like humans. We should be kind to things that have issues and stuff like that. That's a totally different ethics. This is cellular ethics. If you're not good, you're gone. So that's what they do. And then there's M. What color should we use for M? You want red again? We already got red. Dark. Can you see the dark green? Is that? Yeah, you can see it. Okay, cool. All right, M stands for mitosis. All right, so mitosis is the process where the DNA divides. So you've got your prophase, your metaphase, your anaphase, and your telophase. In fact, let's hop over to mitosis real quick. If you flip over your paper, you should see the phases of mitosis. Helps if we put it into context a little bit. Yeah, bringing back them nightmares, right? So what are we looking at in picture one? Interface. Yeah, and so G1, S, and G2. Those are all going to be going down in interface. And then we start to see in our next phase, our little nucleus 
dissolves. We start to see our DNA here. We say it condenses into chromatids. You see that? Okay, you want me to zoom in on it? Let me zoom in. Uh, next time I'll get them all in the same thing. So DNA is normally all squiggly and out and about. We'll start to see it wind up really tight. It's got these little histone proteins and it starts wrapping around those. And it kind of like, uh, imagine we have just like a room full of yarn and we're starting to bundle up all that yarn so it's more organized. Uh, we'll notice those X's starting to show up. We also start to see our centrioles. And we'll talk about these guys. These are our centrioles. Move to the poles. North pole, south pole, east pole, west pole, whatever. Opposite sides of the cell. So we'll start to see, you can already start to see them moving. These guys are going that way. Those guys are going that way until they get to the opposite sides. But here, when you start this whole process, this is known as prophase. And then everybody's favorite phase, because it is the most easy one to identify under a microscope, metaphase. So I always like to think of metaphase. M stands for middle. And so we see all our little chromatids are going to be attached to spindle fibers. Everything's lined up down the middle. This is actually, this phase is where we have the M checkpoint. And so the M checkpoint is going to make sure that every chromatid is attached to spindle fibers and that the spindle fibers are ready to separate. Everybody's good to go. All the replication looks good. And if things don't line up or if there's some free floating, if there's like an X over here in the corner or something, it's going to stop it. It's going to shut it down. It wants to make sure that everybody's lined up and ready for equal dispersal. And if we're all good, then we're going to move into anaphase. I like to think of this one as where they go away from each other. So it's really kind of cool here. And um, they didn't have, I don't know if they discovered this when I was in high school. I didn't learn about it until college, or maybe even when I started teaching. But the very center, um, you have a thing called the kinetochore. And so this one is, there's a little protein that moves the chromatid along the spindle fiber. Oops, spelled spindle wrong. D-L-E. Along the spindle fiber. So scientists for a while, they thought that the spindle fibers were kind of like a fishing line and that the centriole was like winding it back in. Um, that's not true. It's more like Indiana Jones. Have you ever seen like Indiana Jones or an adventure movie where somebody's like running across the bridge and every step they take, the bridge is falling apart behind them? That's actually what happens. So there's a little protein there that's walking that chromatid to the opposite side. And as it passes over, the spindle fiber falls apart behind it. So it gives the illusion that it's pulling the spindle fiber in, but really it's just like walking down the bridge with the bridge collapsing behind it. It's kind of cool. There's some cool experiments they did to figure that one out. And then the last one is telephase. It kind of looks like a telephone. 
right? The old school phones got the two on either side. So telephase, we end up with two new daughter cells. And so we'll see in here the nucleus reforms. You also see uh, the DNA starts to unwind again. So it can start doing its job and they start looking like two brand new cells. Um, also what happens here, our little arrow that we don't mention is um, cytokinesis. And so cytokinesis is um, moving everything else. So that's where all the cytoplasm moves, the Golgi's and um, Golgi bodies, endoplasmic reticulums, lysosomes, peroxisomes, mitochondria, chloroplasts, if it's a plant, um, all those guys separate out in cytokinesis. So the cells actually really prioritize the movement of the DNA. Why would moving the DNA be more important than moving all the organelles? Protect what about it? What's right? The codes. The codes, the coding, the information. It's like if um, every time we went to build a new school, we built the library first because the library is where all the information is at. That's how um, cells treat it. They build the library first because if we screw up an organelle, we have the code to make a new organelle um, as a backup. So um, information gets priority over um, machinery kind of in a way. And all that happens in the M phase. So if we go back to our previous picture, let's just fill in that last little gap. Not much, but PMAT, our checkpoint, where does the M checkpoint happen? Which phase of mitosis is the M checkpoint? Metaphase. And when we come back from break, we'll learn about meiosis, which looks a little bit different, um, but that also has two M checkpoints in it. So metaphase is the most important one there. That's where the M comes from. And then, like we mentioned earlier, there's this little phase that's not really included in your thing, and that would be cyto. Kinesis. It's technically its own phase. It gets overlooked. It's like a middle sibling, you know? Like, oh yeah, you're you're here too. <laughs> and that's the cell cycle. So I'm leaving at three to go get my blood done. Okay. And I was like, if I just pile everything I'm taking, I like that. It's all in the car. Because now it's not my problem. Yay. <laughs> yep. All right. So let's look at regulation. I'm not going to go crazy in depth on this because it's another sort of thing that most of the questions that you're ever going to get on it involve pictures. Yay. I heart pictures, right? So when we look at here, what, what do you think this picture is controlling? What do you think we're looking at here in this image? The cell cycle, right? As in like, when does it do the cycle? When do these chemical reactions happen? And so if we kind of pay attention to what's going on, cyclin is the dotted line, right? Does the dotted line, that line ever change? No. So this always stays 
the same. And its name is kinase. If it has a name like kinase, what does that tell you about this particular little guy? It's an enzyme because it ends in ace. And if its name is ki kinase, what's it going to do? What kind of energy does that sound like? Kinetic. So enzyme that... Uh, I'll, for lack of better term, does something. It's probably going to involve some sort of movement, right? Because kinetic energy is typically oversimplifying it. It's probably a movement of energy. But what does cyclin-dependent kinase depend on? Yeah, it depends on cyclin because it's called cyclin dependent. Oh my gosh, that's like crazy, right? So let's look at cyclin is the solid line. So we see that, oops. Ah, come on, work with me. We see that here are solid lines. So cyclin goes up and down. So we would say it cycles. Now, if you look at the third picture, what do you notice about the third picture when you compare it to the first one and the second one? It's together. So if I take cyclin-dependent kinase plus cyclin, I get maturation-promoting factor. So we also see here, it's got a little phosphate involved. So this guy gets phosphorylated because we added a phosphate. And if we phosphorylate something, that means it's going to do something, right? Anytime I stick a phosphate on something, it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna do something. So what do you think maturation promoting factor is going to do? Because if we look here at our graph, you'll notice it is at its peak right here. And actually even let me take that over to a better peak to look at. Look at its peak right here. What happens when maturation promoting factor is at its highest level? What other process is going to take place? Yeah. So if we go from the peak and we trace our peak down, all the peaks occur at the beginning of mitosis. So the guy, this guy's job is to trigger, I can't spell today, mitosis. Oh my gosh, don't do that. So what would happen in a cell if my cyclin, instead of cycling, stayed at super high levels? What would happen? It would stay the same. So if I took my solid line and I kept it high, what other, what other line would also be really high? Maturation promoting factor. So if I have my cyclin level is always really, really high and my cyclin dependent kinase is naturally high, my maturation promoting factor will also be high. And what does a high level of maturation promoting factor do? Triggers mitosis. So if cyclin, I put a little note, if cyclin 
doesn't cycle, then the cell can't regulate growth or no growth. So low leads to no, high leads to mitosis. The cell will be stuck in mitosis if that level of cyclin stays permanently high. And guess what happens if we have a cell that is constantly making copies of itself over and over and over again without any regard to the checkpoints. It's like, I don't care if there's 30 of us, but let's make 30,000. Ask cancer. So we like to avoid that, right? And the really sad reality of it is, is you will know somebody, if you don't already, you will know somebody who has cancer and it could be you and it sucks and you don't want it. But if you catch it early enough, what's the best thing to do to stop the cancer? Kill the cells. Kill the ones that are out of control. Either use chemo to destroy them internally. They'll do surgeries to remove them. But what super sucks is if one cell survives the removal process or survives the treatment, it comes back. Now, your white blood cells can naturally attack cancer cells, but if the system gets overwhelmed, you're out of luck. So there's another little look at it with our cyclin, cyclin-dependent kinase. I gave you that picture, right? Okay, so it's kind of the same thing, just looks cuter. Let's look at cancer, though. We're almost done. Proto-onco. This literally translates to pro-cancer. You naturally have cancer genes in your system. Hopefully, though, we keep them shut down. So sometimes those cancer genes, when your cells are undergoing meiosis especially, sometimes, and even replication, we accidentally move things to the wrong spot. You're DNA gets a little creative sometimes. So when it's replicating, sometimes these genes get moved accidentally during replication. And so sometimes you have a normal growth stimulating protein. We have proteins that normally tell cells, especially if we're looking at a cell um, like cyclin, we accidentally put a new promoter and we get too much cyclin. We get it in excess. And that cell is being told, go, 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 make more cells, mitosis, woohoo, let's make it happen. Sometimes you get gene amplification where you get multiple copies. Oh, crap, like the DNA and replication got messed up, and instead of making one copy of a growth gene, it made extras. And so now, again, we get excess. The cells are being told, replicate, 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 and they're not being stopped. Sometimes we get a point mutation. Again, this is some sort of error in synthesis where we screw up a gene and we end up again with excess being created. Or you might get a hyperactive or degradation resistant protein. Basically, you can't stop it. Some of these issues can be caused by environmental effects. You know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fell into a pile of ooze, got muta mutated. And sometimes it's genetic. You might have a gene in your family that 
you inherited that's very uh, likely to cause cancer at some point in your lifetime. And sometimes it's just random bad luck. Sometimes it just happens. And because you undergo so much DNA replication in your lifetime and you end up with about like 30 oopses every time you make a new cell, some of those oopses end up with cancer. Hopefully your body will catch it. That's why it's important you get lots of sleep at night, that you eat good foods, so you keep your immune system in top production, and they can naturally stop it. What we've noticed, though, really interesting, is that for most cancers, there's two things that typically have a high incidence of happening. Let's look at this one real quick. Ooh, first, first and foremost, uh, what kind of signaling system is that one? Have we seen that funny one before? Uh, G-couple protein tyrosine kinase or ligated ion channel. This is the T1. So this is a tyrosine kinase. So this is a tyrosine kinase. Uh, what do we call this little growth factor in generic terms? A ligand. So you guys were asking me about like examples of what your projects could look like. This is one. My ligand is growth factor. The receptors are my tyrosine kinases. My transduction is a phosphorylation cascade right here. That is my sending the signal through the process, except in this one, my normal response is to create a gene that stimulates the cell cycle. So everything but the gray box is what you would normally see. I got a tyrosine kinase, my G protein gets activated, and then I end up uh, transcribing a little bit of DNA that's going to stimulate the cell cycle. So this is basically telling it to go. In a lot of people with cancer though, they have a mutation that my G protein is hyperactive. And instead of waiting for, it doesn't wait for a ligand before sending the signal. So it just turns on. No growth factors required. The system gets stuck in on. So this is like if it was a car this is a gas pedal always on go. Now, do I get high points for creativity for a presentation like this? Not really. I'm just showing you a picture. But would I get credit for explaining to you, like, here's what it normally should do, here's how the mutation works? mediocre points. All right. But yeah, so normally we should see it, but in a mutation, we turn that RAS protein on. It goes crazy. It's like, go, 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 go. Most cancers have this issue. The other issue most cancers have is an issue with P53. So here's another one. This is actually a gene that gets activated if something is damaged. So it's normally activated when DNA is messed up. So you can see here my UV light coming in. This is basically kind of serving like my signal, the UV light and the DNA damage. 
They're messing up the system. I've got little protein kinases. This is my transduction. So when the DNA is damaged, it triggers these little protein kinases. The response <laughs> is that they're going to create a strand of DNA that is going to inhibit the cell cycle. This is my stop. So if my DNA is messed up, it makes this little protein that says, all right, you're either going to go to G0 or you're going to die. And that little cell will be like, no, blah, 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 and it dies. Unless there's a mutation. So defective or missing. So something, the P53 gene is messed up in most cancers because normally in a cancer in a cell we would see there's an issue we would shut it down but in cancers this gene doesn't work so if it was a car that would be like cutting your brakes you can't stop And if you've ever been in a car where the brakes don't work, it is scary. I had that happen to me in college. Luckily, at the last second, I thought, like, oh, I've got the e-brake. And I could pop the e-brake and stop the car. Otherwise, I was going to go through a wall. Because I put my foot down to the floor to stop, and I did not stop. It was an old car. Keep your maintenance up on your cars. So that's a second example just using a picture of a signal transduction pathway and the mutation. And so for your final picture, right? Just one more. Is that all I gave you? Did I give you extras? No, oh, the last one on the bottom is basically a summary of the two. If we have overexpression so if we have our RAS protein pathway, is always on. Or if we have P53 mutated and not stopping the cell cycle, What you're probably going to end up with? Cancer. So ultimately, cancer is unregulated cell growth. The gas is on or the brakes are on. All right. That is your lecture. Thanks, guys.